to them. Right. So, well, I'm seeing, um, looks like we have, certainly we have better than a quorum and people are still rolling in. So let's just give it another minute or so. It's only 6.01. Uh, Raven, do you need to share a screen or anything tonight? I wasn't planning on it. I was just planning on us having a conversation and answering sure. questions that the group has, but Perfect. Uh, yeah. Thank okay. you for being here let's, tonight. Let's start. Um, we have a really full agenda tonight, but that's nothing new. We always seem to. So I wanna get right to it. Thanks everyone for being here. And unfortunately, I would love for everybody in the room to introduce themselves, but we just can't do it on, on Zoom. Hopefully sometime in the near future, we'll be able to do that when we're face to face again. So I am going, to, as I typically do, I am going to introduce our board so everybody knows who we are. So working from my screen, uh, Bill Bagnell, our, uh, uh, Secretary and Communications Chair. I'm Stan Pankin, President of PDNA. Uh, Judy Duncan, uh, Chair of our Livability and Safety Committee. Patricia Cliff, uh, Board Member. Glenn Traeger, Board Member. Uh, moving along, John Hollister, Board Member. Uh, Jerry Pike, Board Member. David Dicer, Vice President and co-chair of Planning and Transportation Committee, Mary Seip, board member, Betty Lou Koffel, board member, John Warner, board member and uh, chair of the Emergency Preparation Committee, Angelina Shamborska, board member, Christian Maynard Phillip, uh, board member and our treasurer, uh, Christy Barrows, board member, uh, Tom Lavoie, board member, Linda Witt, board member. Laura McDermott, a board member, also is the executive director of the Pro Business, Biz, Business, Pro District Business Association. Now, did I miss anyone? If I missed anyone, my sincere apologies. I think I got everyone. Uh, Sarah, are you there? I think I saw you. Sarah Hover. Okay, I'm not sure she's here. Okay, let's move on. Uh, thanks for your indulgence. Let's quickly, if we can, approve the minutes of our meeting of May 13th, if everybody has seen that. If there are any comments, corrections, I would ask for a, a motion to approve. I move that we approve the minutes as written. And a second. I second. Okay, we have a second. So let's do this backwards. If anybody opposes, raise your hand. Okay, any abstentions? Okay, unanimous, great, thank you. So we're gonna to go to our public safety report. Uh, Jake, Jake could not make it uh, tonight, but we have uh, someone, uh, Lacey Sparling, Lieutenant Lacey Sparling, uh, who is as, uh, Jake, Jake had said in an email, uh, she's probably much better than he is. So uh, Lacey, <laughs> sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, oh, that's fine. But we're, we have, thank you for coming and we really appreciate hearing uh, what's going on uh, in the neighborhood and in the city as well. And we always like to get some perspective of what's happening on the public safety front. And then uh, we always usually have a few questions. So. Sure. Uh, please tell us uh, what's happening. All right, um, Jake is the expert, so he he sells himself short. So I'm newer at Central Precinct, and I won't take a much, uh, take up much time. But um, I'm the afternoon shift lieutenant, so nice to meet all of you. Um, but he asked me to share a couple of things with you guys, and so um, our neighborhood response team is continuing to follow up on the riots and vandalisms that occurred in the Pearl in February. Um, I know they've been working on those and are continuing to. They just finished uh, one um, that they sent forward to the DA's office for review and that covered multiple um, locations where there was damage. So those will continue to occur. 
Um, our enhanced community safety team is working on the shooting that occurred at Marshall and Station Way a couple weeks ago. And again, our neighborhood response team has been working in conjunction with them going out and doing the follow-up and they've contacted all of the campers in that area um, working on that case. Our um, central patrol has started to put out bike patrols on the weekends and they're hoping to do that when we have the staffing, when we have the overage and we're able to do that. And um, they plan to put those bikes out in the Pearl as much as they can or when they can. So that's up and coming. Um, hopefully you'll see them out shortly. Uh, camping complaints are continuing to come in um, as expected right now. Um, and all those need to continue to be reported to the houseless urban camping uh, impact reduction program at the pdxreporter.com. And just so everyone is aware, the fires in the camps, um, they're on the city's radar. And then our, <clears throat> excuse me, our neighborhood response team, um, they're involved in the discussions with outreach workers and fire going out and making the awareness for the campers for safe usage of um, warming and cooking fires. And then our neighborhood response team, in case you had an interest, is also, <clears throat> they're working a retail theft case uh, involving uh, REI in the Pearl right now. Uh, I think that's the main, I think that's mostly what I have. Um, as, as you guys know, the gun violence continues to be a, an issue for the city. I know that they just put out stats. Mm -hmm. I think we've had 486 um, shootings this year, <clears throat> excuse me, and then 43 homicides. So um, as we balance the needs and go forward, that's always kind of a driving factor too. Um, yeah, so I think that's all I have for updates for right now. Lacey, could you, could you, uh, it's not in the Pearl, but we are, of course, concerned about all of downtown and the entire city and things that happen elsewhere. Can you speak at all to the incident that happened in Nordstrom's? And I think it was a week or so ago. And it seemed like a pretty violent and scary incident. And the uh, perpetrator was just uh, on a let go with just a citation. And I don't think most of us understand that. We feel something as, as, as violent as that seemed to be, or at least that's the way it sounded, uh, why there would just be a citation. And yeah, <clears throat> um, sure. So in this incident, um, I actually just did the review for that. Um, this call came out as a potential shots fired. It was a violent shoplifter. Is this, is this the one you're referring to? Yes. Yeah, so um, he it ended up that there weren't shots fired, but he had made some threats uh, with the gun while in the location. And the disturbance was so loud of slamming things and destroying things that people thought it was shot. So it initially came out that way. Um, so officers actually contacted him, arrested him, um, on multiple charges, there was a force encounter. Um, and uh, he was cited and not taken to jail in this case because he had um, said that he had swallowed narcotics. So that's standard protocol to go to the hospital. Um, and um, so essentially he was issued citations rather than going to jail in that case. So, if, so what happens the citation, just for the edification of those, those of us here, what happens after that? So there's a citation, is that person supposed to appear? Yeah, so he'll have to court? appear in court. Um, he, got, he got several citations, so he'll have to appear in court generally 30 days out uh, on the charges. And if he doesn't appear, then is that when a warrant is issued? Is yeah, he'll get a, a warrant issued for his arrest, so. It's not, it's not an ideal circumstance, but um, it's, it's protocol that they, they can't go to jail if they've uh, ingested narcotics. Okay. Any and and it, in addition to that, um, yeah, in addition to that, we also have the jail has COVID restrictions right now. So they're only accepting uh, bookings on very limited circumstances. So that's a consideration as well. Um, his charges may not have been bookable offenses. I'd have to follow up on a couple of those, but. Okay, thank you. I see a question from Patricia. Hi, 
I followed that fairly closely. And a lot of these charges were felony charges, which alarmed me because if you have felony charges, somebody should not be just let out on the street. I don't know how long he was held in the hospital, but subsequent to being held in the hospital, in my opinion, when you have felony charges, you don't give somebody a citation, you arrest them and incarcerate them. I mean, if this gentleman doesn't show up on the street, you know, is, is danger on the streets, it's, it's a disgrace, in my opinion, that the police haven't done more to prevent that. So I, I was very troubled by it myself. Yeah, I can understand your frustration. I, I agree that's challenging. Um, one of the things that we look at when um, in these situations is um, the medical recommendations. So when someone has swallowed narcotics, sometimes they can be held up to 48 hours for observation. And uh, I don't know the specifics of when, if he's still incarcerated or when he was released, or how long he was um, or not incarcerated, but in the hospital. So. I understand your frustration, but that's one of the considerations that um, we look at. And um, we, at times we've had uh, jail staff has had the staffing to be able to sit with those folks and monitor. And I don't know what the circumstances, currently I don't know that we have jail staff to do that. So if that's the case, oftentimes that would be um, our support function um, sitting for two days at the hospital, you know, with our staffing shortages is not, not always feasible. So, but I, I understand your frustration. Well, I, I, I think there's been a lot of frustration. This is nothing new about certainly with the direct action marches here in the Pearl and of course across the city where there are some number of arrests and uh, uh, really no accountability virtually and I know that has a lot to do with the district attorney office. And, but I, I will say from my knowledge, some of that seems to be changing. And I know there have been more arrests happening and I'm happy to see that, but I think most of us feel it's not enough. So I'm just, I'm just saying that I know there's you know, nothing you can, you can do about that, but just so you know that that's, that's how I think a lot of the population is feeling these days. There's just not enough accountability. So that's much bigger, much bigger conversation, of course. Sure. I understand. And we share some of those same frustrations as well with processes yeah. and, and limitations. Um, so I can understand that. Yeah, we, we know that you do. So any other questions for Lacey, anybody? Uh, Judy? Hi, Lacey. Um, I know that what we've heard during the pandemic, the reason that so many people are not incarcerated is because of the COVID, the, the um, problem with um, putting people into a jail. But now that things are changing, are you seeing any movement anywhere or hearing anything about the timeliness of some of this easing up so that people can be incarcerated? Um, I don't know what's dri driving the jail, their guidelines for acceptance. Um, so I, I don't specifically have the firsthand knowledge on that. So I don't know if they're basing it on state guidelines or that's just really not my wheelhouse. So um, we just, they communicate with us what they're accepting people for and um, what, you know, yeah. So we, I have not heard of any changes. I, I would assume as we progress and, and get to more herd immunity that the governor will change that. I think we all kind of suspect that at some point the, uh, they're gonna loosen, but specifically with the jail and the ability for booking, I have not heard, but I can follow up and see if I can't find that out for you guys. That'd be great, thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Lacey. I don't see any other questions. I noticed that, I don't wanna put him on the spot, but I noticed that uh, Commander Craig Dobson is here. I wonder if any anything he wanted to add, Commander. Oh. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, my connection isn't very good. That's why you don't have my beautiful picture. Uh, uh -huh. I don't have anything to add other than we have no control over uh, what the jail rules are. 
my understanding is the COVID rules actually came down from uh, a presiding judge, either at the state level or the county level. And that's who makes those decisions of who is allowed in the jail based on the COVID restrictions. But our hope is that it will open soon so that uh, we can push some of those folks through. Okay. And we do have two uh, hands raised, uh, Christian and Thompson, and then Dave Dysert. Christian, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious. It seems in the news that I'm seeing a lot about arson. Is arson on the rise in Portland right now? Lacey? I guess either yeah, Lacey I, or Craig answered yeah, that. I, oh. <laughs> um, I, I, don't, I couldn't specifically give you statistics on that. Um, I will say that it's obviously um, when we're talking about um, protest events, it's a, it's a serious concern, um, obviously for citizen safety, officer safety, um, but, uh, and then as we kind of get into summer and fire season, especially after last year, it's a concern. But if it's specifically on the rise, I would have to check statistics that I don't know specifically. There, there just happened to have been a, a string of emails today on that very topic. I, I couldn't keep track of it. It was this afternoon, but apparently they are on the rise. And I think Officer Matt Jacobson has been involved in that discussion to some extent. So we can dig up some more information and, and maybe get that out there uh, to, to answer that question. But from my knowledge, it, it certainly is on the rise. Um, Thank you both. David? Well, we, you know, accountability obviously is a is an issue, but, um, you know, we've tried incarceration in this country. We have a massive uh, drug problem. Drugs are super strong and cheap on the street right now. We have a massive issue with mental illness. So I just want to make sure that people listening here, the Pearl District is not pro-incarceration. We're pro-public safety. So... Uh, that's a bigger issue than the Pearl District, but it's 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 an issue nonetheless. So, a question specifically about the Pearl District, Lacey, Could you? I just want to know in the in 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 the current context what we can expect in terms of patrols from the police bureau in the Pearl District itself. Is there a regular routine? I know you guys are stressed for you know numbers, and you're we've been told you're largely have to be reactionary because of your stress of of number a headcount. Is there a regular scheduled patrol that we can expect to rely on in the Pearl District? Thanks. Um, outside of your district officers and your neighborhood response team, um, I, we don't have like a specific, um, and I, I think what, correct me if I'm wrong, probably what you're looking for is foot patrols, bike patrols, or specific, very specific to the Pearl. Um, we would love to be able to do that. And um, I hope that we will be able to do that. But right now that's really as uh, staffing allows. Um, sometimes we run three or four districts short. Um, sometimes, occasionally we do have the overage and we're able to do that, but it's really dependent upon staffing. And then part of that also is that balance of, um, you know, as we talked about, and you guys have mentioned all of the issues, um, that uh, central precinct is unique in the Pearl District, but also citywide, the gun violence kind of, um, even sometimes when we have a plan to do mission or very focused work, we have these homicides that are uh, extremely time intensive on the front end responding, but then also the follow up on that. So I think um, I, the, I'd like to be able to say yes, but no, I don't know that we have specifics. But again, I will follow up with um, Sergeant Matt Jacobson and, and see if he can give you guys um, a more specific answer. They may have some specific missions that they'd like to do or that they have in the works. But I think in general right now, um, I don't know of any specifics. I do know that we want to get more foot patrols out. And so we're working on like, how can we do that? How can we do these things, balancing all the other stuff going on? So, so would you, real quick, is, is this, is that across the board in the city? Or are we like every other neighborhood that there, there are no assigned patrols, there's no schedule or, or is it that we're just not a priority neighborhood? 
Uh, I, I don't know of any specific neighborhood or association or any area that has a um, specialized patrol response. So if there is, it would I would be surprised. I think our staffing really drives that when we're talking about mission specific work. I think um, probably here in the in Central Precinct, we've done more than the other precincts as far as being able to put out bikes. I don't think the other precincts have done that or foot patrols. So, um, so I think that's kind of a citywide thing. Thank you. Hey, thank you. It's Commander Dobson, if, if I can just jump in just a little bit. Um, so just to clarify, we do have district officers that are assigned to the Pearl District. So that there are officers almost 24 seven that are assigned to your area, um, but not, uh, not in a foot capacity or a bicycle capacity, if that makes sense. So um, as we staff, we staff in geographical areas. And so depending on the shift and depending on how many people we have, we'll, we typically look at um, areas where we see higher amounts of crime or calls, and then we'll staff those districts, which are geographical areas. Um, the Pearl, uh, and Lacey, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but typically most of the downtown area is staffed almost 24 seven. Now, having said that, like Lacey pointed out, due to our staffing issues, if there's a shooting somewhere, oftentimes we will have to empty out parts of the city the entire city to go cover that, or if it's if there's civil unrest. But normally, you will have an officer assigned to your area. Uh, did, did, did that help clarify that somewhat? Yeah, I, I that's a important distinction. I appreciate that. I, you know, someone assigned to respond, but in terms of actual patrols, visible patrols, um, we're not seeing that on a regular basis. But yeah, I appreciate the distinction of what you're talking about. We do have resources, is what you're saying, dedicated to us, but they're just not actively patrolling all the time. You don't have the resources for that. Is that correct? Well, sometimes they're not because they they get pulled to go cover another call. Um, but but typically they should be in your area to take the calls around your place and uh, that geographical area, if if that makes sense. It does. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you. No. I, I, saw, I saw the big hand. Oh, sorry. Of, I'm sorry. I saw the big hand of John Hollister raise. Which uh, John, you have a question? And this yeah, will be the, yeah, the yeah. last question as we have to move on. Yeah, and just kind of a, a clarification, I've heard that there has been um, really good communication and increased communication between the, uh, the police bureau and a number of private security companies, and to be able to pass that information back and that sometimes some of the, I'll call it the, the non-emergency, the non-gunfire stuff can be, uh, you know, mental health things, so those types of things can be dealt with with some of the um, some of the other resources, some of the private security resources, and but also have that upward communication with the police bureau if uh, if if uh, assistance is needed. Can can you talk about that or, and how that's working? It, it seems that that seems promising to me. Uh, I. The, I, I'm not familiar with what you're talking about with private security. Uh, I, I might defer to the commander. He may know more about that, specifically if it were uh, private security. Commander, are you on here? I am. Um, th there are certain, uh, certain companies that we have good relationships with uh, and always have and do that kind of communication. Um, it, it, some of that is difficult uh, just due to the nature of who do you call and typically it comes into 911 or our non-emergency as opposed to you know sometimes others will call directly to the security companies and it will depend on uh, those areas that have security. Um, we are trying to get back into a regular meeting with all of our security companies to be able to share information um, that kind of fell apart during COVID with the lockdown and, and that. Um, but we are trying to reestablish some of those links so that we have a better uh, network of being able to communicate with each other. 
Yeah, great. Because I, th I think the, the real key on all this is, is the communication and, uh, you know, um, hopefully the many hands make light, lighter work and be able to everyone work together. And, you know, and even I think that the Pearl is blessed also with a, with a foot patrol team uh, that also can do observe and report. And the, the more information, the more intelligence we can get from, uh, from, from people to be able to take action and, and, and get some of these things done. And then everyone could be focusing on the most important thing for their job. And, and so, yeah. So I, I just, I, I saw that as a ray of hope, ray of hope and, and uh, uh, Commander Dobson, thank you for, uh, for clarification on that. So uh, Commander and Lieutenant, thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. We, we appreciate what you do. We know you have a really, really tough job. I guess these days tougher than ever. So thank you and uh, please, please stay safe out there and hope to see you or Jake or whoever can attend next, next month. So thank you very much. So we're gonna thank move you. on. I appreciate it. I'm hoping that eventually we can all meet together again, like yep. you do, so that I can actually see you and shake everybody's hand and say hello. That would be great. We, we look forward to that, Craig. Thank you. So moving on, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce uh, Raven Russell from uh, Bybee Hope Lake Center. Uh, many of you may know that if you don't know that name, it's formerly the Wapato Jail, and I think there aren't too many people who don't know what Wapato Jail was. So I had I had the pleasure of having a tour at Bybee Lake so a couple of months ago, and I was incredibly impressed. And I know that there's a lot more that they've been doing since I was there a couple of months ago. So I thought it'd be a good idea for everybody to understand what they're doing out there. Uh, the wonderful, incredible work and some innovative work as well. So Raven, I'm um, gonna hand it over to you and kind of fill us in on what you're doing. Thank you for that introduction, Stan, and for the invitation to address your group. I actually get to speak to a lot of different neighborhood associations uh, in my role. I do a ton of public speaking, and these days it's usually on camera like this. But um, first thing I'm going to do is put my email address in the chat. So if you do not get to ask a question tonight that you want to talk to me about, feel free to send me an email and I'll get back to you. Um, so there's that. So as Stan mentioned, I work with the Bybee Lakes Hope Center. I am the director of data and major projects for Helping Hands Reentry Outreach Centers. We're the homeless service provider that is creating and operating the Bybee Lakes Hope Center. Uh, Stan, I am going to charge you $5 for using the W word because we don't use that anymore. <laughs> so, uh, but I do appreciate that most people do know it by that name. I'm just not allowed to say it anymore. Um, so we have had the opportunity over the last year and a half to take a community asset that sat empty for a very long time and figure out a productive use for it. And our nonprofit has been in operation for 19 and a half years uh, in February. We're going to be celebrating our 20 year anniversary and we're really excited for that. So look for some more uh, celebration stuff with us for that. But we are a nonprofit that is really centered on the lived experience perspective. Uh, just about three quarters of our staff and almost 100% of our client facing staff have direct lived experience with homelessness. Um, our founder and CEO himself was homeless for 27 years before he created Helping Hands to provide a resource that was not available to him when he was trying to get off the streets. And our model is very different from the other services that are available already in the Portland area. Uh, we take a trauma-informed person-centered approach and as an organization, we are very data-driven. And so uh, we have the luxury that our founders, a little brother who they were separated for about 35 years, uh, they reunited on Facebook in 2012. <laughs> so thank goodness for Facebook. Uh, but his little brother is a tech nerd. And I say that with all the love in my heart, <laughs> but he um, is a tech professional that was helping to create data systems for shopping networks like eBay and Amazon to be able to track their international sales. So when they reunited, there was this really cool meshing of homeless service provider and technology. And Wayne is the little brother. 
he put together a team of volunteer software engineers who built us our own database. There was not another software product that was good for tracking the work that we do and making sure that we had good, clean demographics for the people that we're serving. Uh, the other software products were just not easy to use, not easy to pull reports, and they were duplicative, which means that if a, one person is being served by three different agencies, they count as three different people when you're counting numbers. That does not give you a clear view of how many homeless people we have and who they are, what services they need. So we are very data-driven. We use the information about the people that we're serving to determine what kind of partnerships we need to build, what kind of classes we need to offer on site, and what kind of services services we can connect people to. So the Bybee Lakes model is just a scaled up version of the services that we're already offering in four other counties. Uh, we currently have 11 facilities in five counties. And uh, so in the Portland area, we have trained, I believe we just hosted another class and we now have 56 referral partners. Um, that's 56 agencies in the Portland area, the Tri-County area, that are certified to send people to Bybee Lakes. And so the way that works is if you come across one of those 350 individuals that's been trained to refer in and you are homeless, as long as you are eligible for services, which means that you are ready to live in a clean and sober environment and you're ready to work toward uh, gaining permanent housing again. And as long as you're not a registered sex offender because we house families with children, you get a referral to Bybee Lakes. And when I say ready to be clean and sober, that does not necessarily mean that you have any length of sobriety under your belt. It could have been this morning that you drank alcohol. As long as you are in a mental state where you can manage your own person and make uh, reasonable, responsible choices, then you can still come in for services and we will help that person and guide them through recovery. So we really try to eliminate as many barriers for people as we can, but our focus is on people that are ready to move forward. So we offer low barrier emergency shelter, and that is uh, four days. It's limited to four days. It gives people time to sleep for a couple of days because usually people just need to straight up sleep for two days after living on the streets for any period of time. Uh, it gives them the dignity of a safe place to sleep and a shower. It gives them the mental peace of knowing where their next meal is coming from so that they don't have to focus on those things to survive. They can take a few days to get to know our staff, get to know our program, talk to other program participants and see what it's like living with us before they decide if they want to enroll in our long-term program. Like I said, just about 100% 100, uh, 100 of our client facing staff are people with lived experience. So they can look across the table and say, I know how you feel. I know where you're at and we're going to help you through this. Uh, that's really important for people to develop trust. And so in that four days, they really get to know our staff, get to know our program. And then at the end of those four days, if they're ready to enroll in our reentry program, then we get them moved in and we immediately start working with them. So our specialty is taking as much data as we can about the people, learn their story, hear what they've experienced, hear what kind of traumas they've experienced, hear what things they need. Is it that they need identification first? Is it that they need access to mental health treatment or to recovery assistance? Or maybe they don't need those things. Maybe they already have a full-time job and they've just been living in their car. We listen to them and hear them. And then our case managers create a step-by-step -step guide for them that we call an individual re-entry plan. And that is to guide them through the process of re-entering society and getting ready to be self-sufficient in permanent housing. So, an IRP, the Individual Reentry Plan, IRP, it was a process that was designed after the IEP process in public schools, individual education plans, where you gather all of the people that are interested in helping that kiddo to be able to read or write at grade level, whatever their struggle is. You gather them all around the same table, you create a plan together, everybody knows what's going on with that student, you help them achieve success by wrapping the services around the student. Our founder and CEO was the first felon in the state of Oregon to be able to uh, foster and then adopt uh, a child in Oregon. And that took Betsy Johnson really advocating for him and him getting letters of recommendation from various police chiefs and other community leaders to attest that he had grown and learned and changed as a person since he had committed those uh, crimes and made mistakes in his past. 
And when, when Alan, our founder, when he adopted this little boy named Eli, Eli came to us and he was in the third grade and he couldn't read and he couldn't write. So Alan took him to Gearhart Elementary School and he went through the IEP process with Eli. After that, in 2012, we created our individual reentry plan process modeled after that because we saw so much success with Eli getting individualized treatment and access to services. So that's sort of a really high level view of how our programs work. We do offer that low barrier shelter to give everybody an opportunity, but our program itself is higher barrier because you do have to pass a random drug and alcohol testing. Uh, we do a test right when they come into the program. It does not have to be clean right when they come into the program. So if there's THC in their system, for example, we know how many days it takes to get THC out of your system. We'll ask them when the last time they used was, and then we'll test them 30 days from then. If it's methamphetamine, we know how many days it takes to get that out of your system, et cetera. So as long as they can pass a clean test, as soon as we know it should be out of their system, then they can stay. So again, trying to reduce barriers for folks, but also provi providing support for them and accountability. Um, so that's a really high level overview of our programs and services. Um, I know that Stan wanted me to cover a little bit about that and a little bit about the data that we collect about people. We are really a collaborative organization. We like to share the data that we're collecting because we think that data really empowers people to make good decisions. And so we collect a lot of demographic information. It's really powerful to know who you're serving. I think that as a community, we make a lot of assumptions about people that are homeless. Like if I just said homeless person, there's gonna be a mental image that pops up for everybody. For me, before I worked at Helping Hands, that mental image was somebody who was addicted, probably somebody who had a mental illness, probably somebody who was post-corrections. And it is just not the case that that image fits the majority of people in our community. In fact, only about half of the people that we serve have a history of uh, drug or alcohol addiction, only half, 52%. That number is incredibly low compared to what my assumption would have been. Uh, only 34% of the people that we serve have a diagnosed mental illness. I make the distinction that it's diagnosed because access to uh, medical services and mental health services is not easy in our community. So 34% is going to be low, but it's probably only something like half of the people that we serve actually have a mental illness. Again, probably lower than most people would expect. So it's really powerful to know who exactly you're serving so that you can tailor the services that you're offering to those people. I'll give you an example of how the data for Bybee Lakes is different in the Portland area compared to the other four counties that we serve. So the other locations that we have are mostly rural coastal communities, uh, Clatsop County, which is like Astoria through Seaside, Tillamook County. Those are pretty rural places compared to, to Portland. And so we've been tracking and comparing those counties to the data that we're collecting at Bybee Lakes. There is a 22% increase in domestic violence victims for the people that are at Bybee Lakes Hope Center compared to the coastal homeless people that we serve which means that a huge percentage more of homeless people on the Portland area have experienced domestic violence. That can change the way that you process information. It can change the jobs that you might accept because of the trauma that you've experienced and the fears that you might have. It can change the different service providers you might need to access. It can change the different mental health support that you might need to access and the medical treatment that you might need. That's just one demographic that's vastly different in the Portland area compared to the other communities. So again, data really empowers us to form more partnerships for people that support victims and survivors of domestic violence. It impacts the different classes that we offer on site because we offer classes at Bybee Lakes like what is codependency? how to identify it in a relationship, how to communicate and advocate for your own needs in a relationship. And those types of things can be offered as classes that are optional for folks who have a history of that and who would benefit from those services. So we're really able to tailor the experience in our programs to the traumas and the needs of the people that we're serving. Uh, that as a nonprofit being adaptive like that is something that makes us very successful compared to some of the other, especially low barrier shelter models. 
So that's kind of who Helping Hands is. So I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing at Bybee Lakes. Uh, if you're not familiar with the property, it is a 16 acre parcel of land in the Port of Portland in the Rivergate District. And it is a 155,000 square foot building. Uh, it was built as a transitional center. So uh, it has sometimes called a jail. That's not accurate because it was a minimum security correctional facility that was built to transition people out of the corrections um, and into the community. So all of the nine dorms that are there are all open concept dorms. There were never any jail cells. Um, there are lots of classrooms, a ton of administrative areas, and even a medical bay. So frankly, it's the perfect kind of building <laughs> for the services that we offer because we're able to put people in the dorms that are already open concept. Uh, we've hung curtains for privacy for folks so that they have dignity and they have their own space. We've created bunks. Uh, we worked with a partner in Tillamook that uh, provides furniture. We've been serving their area for years. So they, they know us, they love us. So when we came to them and said, all right, we're gonna need a ridiculous number of mattresses. <laughs> they gave us a really great deal on some memory foam mattresses so we can actually have a comfortable place for these people to actually have dignity of comfort. Uh, that's something that is not widely available in the Portland area and the other shelters. I don't know how many of you have been into the shelters um, in the area, but I've toured about a dozen different facilities uh, before I started program managing the expansion into Bybee Lakes. And I was shocked at how tightly packed in everybody is there and how little space they're given. Uh, that's not the case at Bybee Lakes. We have 155,000 square feet. So we have a little bit of space to give people some elbow room out there. So um, it's really a beautiful place for people to be. It's very white, like the white walls are just overwhelming. Stan, I'm sure you can attest to that. Uh, we're working on some murals to bring a lot of color and vibrancy back into that space and really warm it up a lot. Um, I don't know if anybody here knows Dave Jubitz, but Dave owns the Kids Backyard Store. It's a playground company here in Portland. We met him at the town club. Again, I do a lot of public speaking for the organization. And uh, he came through for a tour afterward and he was like, okay, you need a playground, but you don't need one of my playgrounds because he has small residential wooden ones. But he's like, let me see what I can do. So he found a friend of a friend of a friend in the playground world that had a $100,000 playground set just sitting in storage in North Carolina. So I had to pay the storage fee that was just like $6,000 to spring it from a storage jail. And Dave paid the freight to get it out here. He convinced Playcraft to do ADA upgrades for free to it. And he himself donated a lot of labor and coordinated the donation of labor from all play systems and Playcraft systems. So that this $100,000 playground set is gonna cost us a total of about $15,000, <laughs> which is absolutely amazing. So we have this big, beautiful uh, playground out there now. The installation of that just finished a couple of weeks ago. And so uh, if you decide to come out for a tour, then you'll see that beauty out there. We're really excited to uh, be able to serve families and have them have a fun place to go burn off some energy and not drive everybody crazy inside. Um, so that's really going really well. Uh, we also are partnering with a nonprofit called Vet Rest. They serve veterans here in the Portland community and they offer community gardening, op gardening opportunities to break down barriers and build relationships with veterans. They use it as an opportunity to start discussing trauma, especially post-traumatic stress uh, disorder and help veterans access mental health resources. And so um, their nonprofit is partnering with ours and we're creating what we're calling a victory garden, seems appropriate, um, on site at Bybee Lakes. What started as like a 100 by 100 foot plot uh, community garden has grown to about three acres now on site there. Like I said, we've got 16 acres, so it's a lot of land out there. We worked with Friends of Trees uh, who donated a bunch of shade and native trees uh, to create a lot of beauty on, on the acreage there. There's gonna be walking paths through there and uh, raised garden beds that'll help us grow. Lots of fruits and veggies. We had 120 uh, fruit bearing trees donated. So we're starting to get uh, apple blossoms on the trees now. We're really excited because it's only been a couple months since we put the trees in the ground. So we've been waiting to see, <laughs> to see how long it would take for them to fruit. So uh, in another couple of months here, we're gonna probably be picking fruit on some of those trees, which is really cool. There's already figs on the fig trees. so. 
Uh, so that's what's going on out in the Victory Garden. Uh, so we are operating right now in about a third of the building. Uh, we had planned to be open by the end of December 2020. And then I don't know if anybody noticed, but a global pandemic hit. So uh, some of our major donors that had committed funding had their businesses impacted by the pandemic and had to pull back uh, committed funds. And so rather than go into debt for construction, we paused construction when we realized that we would not be able to complete the building. And our team figured out a way to get a third of the building open, which is six of the nine dorms, um, so that we could start offering services. So we opened in October of 2020. So we've been operating for about eight months now, and it's been really wonderful. There's about 50 people in there right now, which just makes me very happy. <laughs> um, we're near our COVID capacity right now, but we will be able to open more bed spaces soon. Um, our participants have been eligible for vaccines and many, many, many of them uh, want them. So working around their work schedules to help them gain access has been a bit tricky, but we're almost to a point where we have a, cr a critical number of people that are vaccinated so that we can open up upper bunks. We're not using upper bunks right now for social distancing. So very soon we'll be able to open up upper bunks and then we'll have a capacity for 126 people. Uh, we will be completing our renovation by the end of 2021, and then our capacity will be 318 people um, as our minimum. Like I said, there's a medical bay on site, so we're really excited to work with a medical partner to bring services on site. Uh, we already have a process where our staff are certified to sign people up for Oregon Health Plan insurance if they're uninsured. So then they would be able to sign up for health insurance right on site and then get an assessment of their physical and mental health on site. Once you have a diagnosis, telehealth is extremely available these days. That's one of the benefits of COVID. Uh, so we'll be able to get people access to group and, indiv and individual treatment uh, right online. So that's gonna be really a wonderful step for us to be able to do that once the rest of the building opens. Uh, we're also working on a program to add dog and cat kenneling. Right now in the Portland area, there are very, very few options for folks that have a pet with them. And so this will allow us to ser uh, serve a certain number of people that have a pet and they'll give them a clean and safe place to be able to um, have their animal in a kennel. There's a dog run with a section of fencing that we kept up on the property. So they'll be able to take care of their animal out there themselves and uh, be able to do that. So I'm really excited about that. And then the other thing that we're really excited about when we open the rest of the building is that one of the dorms, uh, one of the smaller dorms, that it will have a 24 bed capacity is going to be opened. Uh, we're calling it affectionately a rainbow dorm. <laughs> so this will be an option for folks that identify in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so that if they're, if they would be more comfortable in the rainbow dorm rather than the male or female dorm, then they can make that choice. So that's kind of a really high level overview of where we're at and what our timelines are, what our capacities are and that sort of thing. So I wanna leave time open for questions. Stan, do you wanna moderate that or? Yeah, yeah I, think, I, think, I think we have time for, for, for a couple of questions. questions. Uh, well, I'm, getting, I'm, getting, I'm getting my, getting my own feedback back, back for some reason. Glenn's, Glenn's hands, hands raised. raised. Yeah, yeah, hi, hi. Hi. I just uh, want to thank, thank you for all the good, good work you've been doing. I have, a, I have question. a question. In the past, in the past people, people have given me presentations, presentations and said that, said that the shelters, shelters unless they're in central, central city, city where, there's where there's a lot, a lot of, services, of services, they just, they just won't, won't work, work because, because you know, you know, people, people, they need they services need that are available in areas that are outside the central downtown area. I just like to get your opinion on that since you're not in the central city but it seems like you're providing a lot of good services for people. That's a really common question that we get a lot. Uh, so first, the transportation was a major barrier out there, but TriMet is a really great partner. And so I, we just called up the board president and said, hey, Bruce, can we have a bus stop? <laughs> And he said, yeah, that seems reasonable. We, we really see the value of adding homeless services to our community. Let me see what we can do. And we had a bus stop three weeks later. And so there's a bus stop about half a block away from the Bible Lakes Hope Center, which connects to public transportation. We're really close to the yellow line on the max line that is at the Expo Center. So it's been very accessible for our folks. 
Transportation is a major concern, especially getting to and from work because it's the daily transportation that's an issue. Um, but the Port of Portland has a ridiculous number of jobs and our neighbors out there, especially at OAA Global and at uh, Columbia Sportswear at their warehouse, those are both within a block from the Bybee Lakes Hope Center. And so they're offering actually living wage jobs, $18 an hour to start and benefits on day one uh, for our participants out there. And so that's been really wonderful. They've come over and said, anybody who's eligible for employment, please let them know that we will hire them. Uh, so we have more than half of our folks uh, at the center are employed within a block of home. Um, so that's really lovely. I don't have a client facing role because I'm in our executive staff, but I do spend, I have an office at Bybee Lakes and I'm vaccinated now. So I get to go spend time with clients. It's really wonderful. Um, and I've asked them, how do you feel about being removed from town? Because that's something that I get asked all the time and I would love to have a participant perspective on this. So I've asked about 40 different people that question. Not a single one has told me they wish they were closer to town. I'm gonna let that sink in for a second. Not a single one has told me they wish they were closer to town. What they tell me is, Raven, when I walk out of my front door now, I see bald eagles instead of drug dealers. I see nature, there's peace here. I can walk around on the paths through the watershed. I can rest and relax and have peace and quiet and access to nature that is not available in our community and other areas. And there's distance from the issues that brought them to homelessness. And especially for the half of them that are in recovery, it is very difficult to maintain your sobriety when you're faced with that every single day when you walk out your door. So instead they have bald eagles. And I think that that's really a powerful visual for folks. Um, as far as access to services, that's obviously very critical. You can tell that our model is very collaborative. You can tell that we're really trying to bring things on site as much as we can. Um, that's really an important part of our model is bringing the services to the people. Telehealth has made that really easy for medical things because you can get almost everything on Zoom right now with medical stuff. But the other thing that COVID has done is make a lot of other services available online and on Zoom. So recovery classes are available on Zoom. If you need to talk to your lawyer, they're on Zoom now. If you need to talk to the courts, that's usually on Zoom right now too. And so just about everything that you're going to need to access, barring going to the DMV, <laughs> you're going to be able to do online. So it's really not as much of a barrier as it might have been even 18 months ago. Um, but there really is space on site. Like I mentioned, there's a ton of administrative space. We're going to be looking at offering office spaces to our community partners that are offering critical services for very minimal subleasing, just enough to cover their utilities. We're not looking to make a profit on it. We really want to make services available. And so I think that the space there offers a ton of opportunity for on-site collaboration that really overcomes that barrier that, frankly, for the participants is a good thing. So Raven, uh, we're kind of running out of time here a little bit. This was a great presentation. I hope this has given everyone a much better understanding of what, what you are doing. I know that you do welcome tours, but we you wouldn't want to burn you with you know, a bunch of single tours. So I'm just going to ask if we could put a group together and I don't know what would be the maximum size group you could take uh, would that be a possibility so people on this call right now, if they wanted to come out there, they could just let us know. They could uh, email us and maybe we could put a group together and find a date. Is that possible? That sounds great. Yeah. So we can take up to eight people right now in a single tour, but I'd be happy to host a couple of different tours if there are more people here that are interested. Frankly, we really love it when community members come in and see what we're doing. We find that people have a mental image of I'm going to say it, don't tell anybody, Wapato Jail, that is completely different from what's actually there. And having people that have been inside, have seen what we're doing, have met our staff and can advocate for that and talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends and say, hey, you know what? I saw this really cool place. This is what they're actually doing out there. That's really powerful. So I will make time for a few groups if you guys have interest. Okay. So anyone in this call who's, who's interested, uh, we, you know, can email me or, or Bill and we'll see if we can put something together. So sorry, we can't take any more questions right now. We still have a lot to go through. So Raven, really appreciate it. 
of thank course. you for doing great work and and i hope people will take advantage of when you see it firsthand it really really hits home what's what's happening out there. So. I definitely agree. And if you just have a question that we didn't get to, then feel free to email me. Like I said, I put my email address in the chat. So please go ahead and take advantage of that. I might be a couple of days getting back to you, but I promise I will. Okay. Well, thanks again. Give my best to Alan, please. I will. Thanks, Dan. Talk okay, to you guys right later. Here. All right. Take care. Okay. Uh, on to the next topic. Uh, Portland Street response. Uh, for those on, on this Zoom who are not familiar with that, that is a program that would reduce uh, police presence for certain uh, incidents that occur that are more related to, uh, to nonviolent type incidents, more mental health related, uh, whereby there's a team that would go out with a social worker and a medical person rather than having police come out to calls that they really shouldn't be coming out for. So, so a pilot program was established out in the Lentz neighborhood. Uh, and that's, it, that's been going now for, for a number of months. Most recently, if anybody follows city council, uh, there was supposed to be funding for more street response uh, uh, teams to, to go, uh, various parts of the city. City Council did not fund another almost $5 million and they just continued the funding for just the Lentz program. And the Lentz program so far has been off to a slow start and they've only been having something like two calls a day and it was the decision of City Council or I would say four members of City Council including the mayor not to fund it further until there were more metrics that could uh, give a better sense of how the program was working in Lentz. Uh, very controversial, as you might imagine. And uh, Downtown Neighbor Association, our neighbors, sent a letter to city council and I shared it with the board when I sent out the package, requesting or asking or suggesting that the program be moved to downtown instead of Lentz, where there would be where there is more activity and where they could develop maybe a better set of metrics with many more calls and incidents happening downtown. And by downtown, kind of downtown, Old Town, Pearl, Goose Hollow in particular. In the letter that was sent to city council, the Pearl was mentioned. And I will say I, I did get some uh, unhappy uh, emails from people out east, out in Lens saying, what is, the, what is the Pearl doing trying to take Portland Street response away from us. You're, you're a privileged community and we need it out here. And I had to set them straight. It wasn't the Pearl who requested it. It was downtown and that was misconstrued. So I, I did set that straight. However, I think it's, it's an important conversation for us to have to see if we want to take any position on street response, whether uh, we would want it moved to downtown where it might be, have, be more successful uh, or uh, the other option, which uh, has been taken by some of our neighboring uh, uh, neighbor, neighborhoods, namely uh, Southwest Hills and uh, Old Town, that there should be an expansion of uh, Portland Street response and be funded for an expansion into the downtown area. And I believe, Judy, you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the Livability Committee discussed this. I didn't make that meeting, but discussed it last week. And it was a feeling by that committee that uh, we'd like to see it expanded to downtown. So with that, I, I really just want to open this up for conversation to see if our board has a, a, interested in taking any position on this. Um, and I'd like to hear what everyone has to say, and, or no position, but I uh, won't open up that conversation. So uh, please uh, chime in. Well, I'll, I'll start for you, Stan. Oh, um, then thanks. me. No. Sorry, Bill. You go first. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, you go first. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll jump, I'll start. Um, you know, Stan, as I think I, I explained, um, I thought this letter that down DNA wrote was poorly written. Um, 
and I think it's inflammatory to some degree. Um, so I, I definitely do not want to just see us co-opting onto that letter. Um, I do not believe that the program should be moved from Lentz. There are many reasons why it was started there. Um, I do believe in expansion. I would fully support that. I've been in favor of Portland Street response since I first heard about cahoots down in Eugene, and, and I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, I, but I just want to be sensitive to the fact that we're asking for it to be expanded, in my opinion, expanded for the, re the good reasons to get more metrics, just as Raven was talking about how they are data driven and how they want, they need metrics to prove that something is working or not working or needs to be modified. Um, Portland Street Response is gonna need those metrics as well. This whole city is data driven for better or worse. So I think there's a lot of good reason to expand this program, but I wanna be sure that we as a board, when we're speaking about it here and in anything that we write or communicate that we are sensitive to where this program was begun and that we are simply asking for an expansion to cover some of the downtown area. Thanks, Bill. Christian? Um, yeah, I'll just go for it. Um, thousand percent agree with everything that Bill just said. I'd also love to hear from Judy how that conversation went in a livability meeting regarding expansion. Unmute, Judy, unmute. Something that has uh, changed a little bit uh, during the next three months is that the six downtown neighborhoods are meeting at our Pearl District Livability and Safety Committee meetings. Uh, we're doing this in the effort to have overlap so that we are supportive of one another and um, can keep the communication open. And um, so it is correct that for clarification, the Downtown Neighborhood Association never intended to take the uh, prototype or the Portland Street response away from Lentz. It was purely an intent to explain that the metrics are so much higher in the downtown core and Old Town. And then I would say Goose Hollow follows that. And I, in fact, feel that <clears throat> they more or less shot themselves in the foot by including the Pearl District in it because we, you know, um, we do have um, a less number of the um, street activity that the downtown Old Town and Goose Hollow are, are having. So that's the clarification that I would like to bring to this conversation. It was never meant to take away from Lance it was meant to expand um, and they were being kind by including the Pearl District in this letter. My suggestion at our livability meeting was that each neighborhood write their own letter to the city and that's how it was left. And we have not done anything here in the Pearl yet to write any letters. So each neighborhood, uh, I know Southwest Hills has written a letter. We have not written a letter yet. Yes, and Judy, that, that's what I'm looking here for tonight, whether or not we as a neighborhood want to chime in on that. And that's why we're having this conversation. So looking for other thoughts. Sally? Unmute, Sally, please. Totally in agreement as well that it be expanded and that we support it. I've been around probably a lot more of it than most people have within the Pearl, but also in downtown. And we can use all the help we can get, but we, the downtown and old town really need it. And so does Goose Hollow. Uh, our numbers have pretty much compared to the rest, um, stayed fairly stable, but uh, in terms of um, numbers of tents, that's even under control. And um, so I, there's really no reason for us not to. And Thanks. downtown is where the action is, so. Thanks, Sally. And just, I, I see a question from Linda Witt. And yes, Linda, the intent was for this program to roll out across the city. 
uh, Lentz was supposed to be the pilot program, see how that works, work out the kinks, tweak it, and then roll it out. There, back in last June, uh, $4.8 million was reallocated. I don't even want to use the word defunded, but it was defunded from the police to go towards street response. And that was not renewed in the current budget. Only, I believe it's eight or $900,000 is in the budget to continue the lens program. And again, the reason was that so far the lens program has not proved itself. And the city doesn't want to uh, uh, allocate more money until they have those metrics. So I hope that answers your question. And then John, you have a question or a comment. Yeah. Um, my feeling is there are so many areas that are much more in need of the services than the Pearl District that if the Pearl District, I, I, I just think it could be a one more source of bad press for us uh, of, of, oh, why is the Pearl asking for this? You know, it, it, it's the, um, um, so I, I have that, that's my one thought. And then the other thought too is um, it was it was voted down by city council to expand it um, for the very reason that there are um, kinks in the program. And so they're spending $900,000 and people are going out on two calls a day. So rather than throw four more million dollars at a program that still has some kinks out, they want to work the kinks out. And so, uh, and, and one of the things that they're having trouble with is the 911 and the non-emergency response, which calls should they go on, which calls shouldn't they go on? And the and a, a high number of the calls in Old Town and, and in downtown are ones where there is some type of a, 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 of a threat. And if there's any type of threat, they don't go to that call. And so it, it's the, I think that um, uh, that's, that's why it wasn't expanded. It wasn't expanded because we don't need help. It was expanded because there, there are kinks in the program and why throw good money, money after bad? Why don't we work it out in an area like Lens is not in, in there. It, it's, would it be great if we could have it now and, and do all this thing? Because the need is certainly there. Um, but I don't think the street, I don't think having um, Four hundred thousand dollars worth of resources uh, going around in a van um, is the most effective way to use uh, to use money. So that's just my opinion. John, just to clarify, if if we as a board were to decide to support the expansion of it, I don't think we would be speaking about expanding it to the Pearl. It would be about downtown, and it's it's downtown, it's Old Town, it's Goose Hollow. Those are the three areas that that are suffering the most from incidents we get some overflow of that. Potentially down the road, we might get more overflow. So I think it's really about the downtown as a downtown, not, not the Pearl itself. So I just want to keep that in perspective as we talk about this. Yeah, and I, I think if we just go back and look at some of the dialogue that city council had of why they did not approve it, um, they addressed a lot of those, a lot of those concerns. So that, that might be a good um, history lesson for people to look at and, on why they chose not to expand it. It wasn't because of need, it was because of process. Okay, Judy. Dave, did I start, uh, Dave had his hand oh, up. Go ahead. Actually uh, left Eugene, uh, moved to Portland the year Cahoots was rolled out. Uh, it's one of the few things Eugene does better than Portland. Um, but of course, with everything, it's the devil's in the details, how it's gonna be managed, right? Uh, to Bill's point, you can't manage this thing unless you can measure this and get ground intelligence. The other real problem with this, with this program is unlike Cahoots that was just born out of a need and a good idea, this street response in Portland has come out of the cauldron of the social unrest movement, you know, the Black Lives Matter and defund the police and all that. And so, there is this big cloud overhanging this. We're not just looking, the thing isn't just in the prism of a social service network. It's in a very political dynamic uh, area. And so we have to be very careful here. And I think we should be very clear about what, what, it, what the goal is that we want. And we don't need to be 
um, enamored with a label of a program, but what's the goal? What's the goal? And I think we should just be very clear and consistent in what, our, what we think the goal should be. The goal should be public safety, meeting the need on the street where, you know, the correct people doing the correct uh, jobs, uh, resource management. And I completely agree with Bill, it needs to be data driven. And I think we should stay clear of the political issue and be all about results. Okay, any other? Judy, Judy. I, I agree it should be data driven. I'm sure if we had the data that, that um, Portland would be, or excuse me, downtown would be right, right near the top. The, I have another uh, reason that I'd like to see the street response downtown. We cannot get our city back if people will not come back downtown. And I think it's important to the vitality of our downtown core to make people feel safe uh, so that our businesses can take the boards down from their businesses. And uh, this will help all of us have a better chance to thrive. Thank you. I, I want to make sure our newer board members, if they would like to weigh in on this, I know we kind of talk over, but um, Christy or uh, uh, Angelina or Laura, or I don't believe Heiji is here, but do you folks have anything you want to share or any comments? Okay. <laughs> We're talking about putting somebody on the spot, Bill. I know, I know. But I just want to make others, sure you... There are long-time board members here, too. I've not, we've not said anything yet. And no. You don't have to. I mean, if there is no... I'm, I'm not feeling a consensus that we should get involved in this. That's what I'm hearing here or not hearing. I, I see someone nodding their head, and that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to arrive at. I mean, we are, you know, we are the pro, but we are also part of, I always say this, part of the larger city, part of the downtown core, where we have neighbor, neighboring neighborhoods who are doing things we want to help where we can, just like they want to help us when they can. And I am really, really thrilled that we've got these six core neighborhoods now working together. Uh, and that's really, that's really important. None of us are an island. We, we're all in this together. So that's and why I thought this was part of a conversation we should have. If there's no consensus from the board to join that, that that's fine. But uh, that, that's my sense right now that I don't see a lot of excitement about this because I don't hear too many people speaking up. So um, I can I can speak up to this. It, it makes it does make sense to do the expansion just for um, again as you know you, you apply the the typical work where when you work in silos it's a little bit less effective when you collaborate. So um, from from my point of view again like there I, I may have a little bit more of a myopia on this. I um, as I'm a newer addition into the. <laughs> into this committee and to the board so that's my uh my view but you know, open for others to share theirs of course thank you thank you angelina you know i don't have a different opinion john, stan I, I think you're spot on with your takeaway but but john coming back to what you were saying earlier i agree with you i think you know i understand what the what the city council was saying, I think part of this effort is to get them to revisit this. But I do think that we've had, similar to the idea that people don't report gunshots in some cities because they don't think it'll get reported, they don't think it'll get followed up on or it's just become background noise. Um, those should still be reported. And I was talking to Glenn yesterday and I was sharing with him, I think there are a lot of times where we want to call someone to help someone but we know that there's no one who's going to be able to help them. Uh, you know, city police aren't going to be able to respond given the last year of events. So, you know, I want to see this program get as big a test, beta test, if you will, while they work out the kinks and while they work out some of the operational things um, to be able to help uh, respond and help people on the street, which is, you know, their mission. When a policeman 
doesn't need to show up with lights flashing and a gun on their holster, um, can de-escalate a situation. That's where I'm, I, I really want to see this program succeed. I think there's a piece for it here. And I, John, I think you do as well. I don't, I, I, you're not arguing against that. I, I didn't take that from what you're saying, but, but I think there's the idea that every case is violent and they won't show, I don't think is quite accurate because I think there are a lot of times if we felt comfortable calling something into them, we would, if the procedure was in place, if we knew who to call and so on. So I, I just wanted to add that to the conversation. Eddie so Lou. I, I, well, Eddie Lou, I'm what, sorry. Just real, Eddie real, Lou. real quick. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Um, Eddie Lou. Eddie Lou, I think you wanted oh, to speak. Yeah, to I did want to speak to this. I wonder if there's anything we could say that would be um, not saying do this now, but do it as soon as possible and why we think um, downtown would be an interesting, more useful um, thing, sort of on the line of what Judy said. On the other hand, what by not, by not funding this option, they're really putting it off for way longer than I think they need to put it off. Um, so I think just, just to clarify, just another piece of this, city council, as I understand it, they have reserved the right, they, they will be willing to put money into the expansion once they have more information about Lentz. And who knows how long that might take, because so far it's so slow, it could be a long, long time. So ultimately it would be expanded to downtown if, if they decide to move the program forward. So I think the issue here is if they brought the program, I, 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 I don't think they're gonna expand it to here and I don't think they're gonna move it to here. I just don't see that happening. But if they did move it here, it probably would have a better chance of being successful and then really expanding it across, across the entire city. So I, I don't know where we go with this. I don't have a sense that right now we are ready to chime in on this. And if anybody else thinks differently, well, the, please, no, because I do want to move on. We have a lot more to cover. Yeah, the, just real quick, the optics of this are terrible though. I mean, what the city council did, I mean, yeah, let's, you know, we've got crisis on the street in this city like a big crisis and we're, well, we're gonna study this a while. Now there's pretty yes. legitimate reasons why, right? You know, we wanna get this right, but really we have a crisis going on and to have right. the city council going, well, you know, let's, 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 not, let's, not, let's not be too uh, aggressive with this. I mean, are you kidding me? This is the problem that's wrong with this town is that just a sort of lackadaisical, I mean, one of the reasons people love Portland is because we're so laid back, but I'm sorry, we have two crises going on and you can't be laid back all the time. It takes action. And, and a lot of this is, is not actually about the exact dollars. It's not about the exact program. It's an existential crisis that people in Portland feel their city is going off a cliff and they need to see signs, concrete, tangible signs that the garbage is being picked up, that homeless people are getting services, that there's people on the streets doing things. We need signs, evidence, concrete that somebody's doing something, not just sitting around a table going, well, not now, let's study this more. So at some point, are you for it or against it? And I, you know, I get, I get their, I get their backroom metrics, but from an optics public, uh -huh. you know, it's, it's a, it's terrible. And I think we should be on the side of saying we need services now. We need it now. Where are we going to wait until Portland's makes the 50th worst places in the country list? I mean, what are we waiting for? Let's get this going. So here's, okay. here's the other thing is we have, they already have a program in downtown. It's called clean and safe. They Which got is neither clean nor safe, John. And you know that. Yeah. yeah it's neither clean or safe. So it, it's, it's, we got four and a half million dollars that in my mind is, is purely mismanaged. And the, uh, so we want to throw another uh, program that hasn't been vetted downtown that let's just throw some more money at it. And now everyone will feel good. It, it, it's the, uh, the, the city has proven that they're not good at executing on things. And so throwing more, yeah. Oh yeah. Let's just throw four and a half more million dollars down there and watch that go down the drain too. That's a beautiful, beautiful idea, but it, it, it's the, uh, I want something that works. And, and so with the, you know, this isn't, but this isn't rocket science. There's plenty of people, there's plenty of organizations in town that know how to provide services. 
that and aren't police that aren't police. We don't need to reinvent okay. the wheel. We need anyway. I mean, okay. you don't have to throw four and a half million down. down I really opened a Pandora's to, box here, and we mm -hmm. could go on this for yeah. hours. Actually, I think David, get a little bit more passion though. So no, I, I love the passion absolutely. So but, but Patricia and then Judy and then I'm going to try and bring this to some sort of closure. I'm not sure what that is yet. And Mary. Yeah. Oh, Mary. Mary. Okay. I, okay. Dave, um, I I feel as passionate as you do about this, and I want to congratulate you for articulating it so well. These programs, when they start, are not perfect. I mean, there was a whole program from Bellevue in New York that worked well after a number of years where they had a mobile team that went out and, uh, you know, approached people on the streets who were having nervous breakdown. It wasn't perfect, but everybody felt good about it because they knew that the person sleeping under the, under the eaves of some building was being, their problems were being addressed. Maybe not 100%, maybe only 50 or 60%. But people need to know in this city that something is going on. And the image of the city council, oh, well, we'll appoint another committee to study that and we'll do this. It is not encouraging for anybody wanting to come here or live here. I mean, on the Pearl, right here on Northwest 12th, I mean, high end, the, 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 uh, one of the big planters in front of, um, in front of the coffee shop down, shattered, you know, the, on on uh, Flanders, um, three cars broken into and the glasses. Of, I mean, that's not their job, but it, it is what people perceive as going on in the city. And when they don't see something being done about it and outreach to the people that are doing this somehow, and also the, the domestic violence, you know, that causes some of these mental breakdowns, it needs addressing. And it doesn't have to be 100% correct. It has to learn, it's one of those learn on the job, correct yourself as you go. I find it unconscionable that the city council tables these things and doesn't take appropriate action. Thank you. Thank you, you for listening. Mary, I'm going to let Mary, because Mary hasn't had a chance, and then Judy, and then I'm going to try and move on. So Mary, please. Thank you, Stan. I just want to say one thing, uh, you know, that just keeps jumping out at me. You know, I, I've spent the last four years going to city council every week. And, you know, I just have reached this point where I'm so disappointed in our leadership. And it's very difficult for me. Uh, you know, I, I listen to David and I just think, exactly. Uh, we need to see some action. And like something that just strikes me about this as just a no brainer. So they're going on two calls a day on average, tells me they're available to go other places in the city. What, you know, what mental giant can't jump to the conclusion, you know, that, well, gosh, uh, if they're only going to two calls a day in this one little designated area that they're at, why can't we utilize what we have and allow them to go to calls in other parts of the city? It's just stupid. You know, it's just all I can say is it's just plain stupid. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> that's, my, that's my brilliant comment. <laughs> no, it it's, makes sense, Mary. Judy may have the final word. Okay, I you really got me going there, David. I mean, you got me all worked up. I, I feel so strongly about this that we've got to do something for the downtown core. So guess what? what we've usually been doing because the city's not doing their job is now we with the livability and safety committees are talking about getting education about dealing with mental illness. You know, here we go again, but we can't sit back and wait and have nothing happen. And that's, that's my final word. Okay, so I, the way I read the room, the tide has turned. And I think I think I see or see us leaning towards asking for the expansion of downtown. And if anybody strongly disagrees, John, you probably do. John Hollister, maybe John one or two, I don't know. But uh, I am willing to draft a letter. Maybe someone else on the board can help me with that. And um, if uh, if this board is okay with that. Uh, 
I would ask for your support in drafting a letter and it would be shared before we send it out. Is, does that, and I'm not even calling for a vote uh, uh, I'll make at a this motion. point. Sorry, Patricia. I went, I'll that, make a motion if you need it. Yeah, well, let's make, let's make a motion. Yeah, please, Patricia, please make a motion. Let's make this a little more official. All right. I'd like to make a motion that the Pearl District uh, Neighborhood Association write a letter and take a position with the city that we support the expansion of this program into the downtown areas that are most needy, even though it is an imperfect system at the moment, but that we will support building on the information that we have. And then you have appropriate statistics to move forward with it. You can't do it with this tiny little, tiny little um, sampling. So that's, you can refine the motion, but that's basically what I think it should say. Second. Okay, uh, Patricia, you just basically drafted the letter. Thank you. Oh, um, <laughs> I, I may, seek some, may seek some help from you. Uh, I, I, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a vote. Uh, I'm gonna work it backwards. Uh, all opposed, please raise your hand or speak up. All, this is so all opposed to writing a letter seeking expansion of Portland Street response. I don't see any opposition uh, in favor. No, I, I abstain, I should say. I should say abstain. Any abstentions? I see one, you'll help me out with the count here. I see two abstentions, I think. Who are you seeing abstain? I'm sorry, could, uh, who's, uh, John's abstaining and- uh, oh, Linda, Linda. Abstaining. Christy, is that it, three? Okay, okay, the motion passes. We will, I, yeah, got you, John. And Linda Witt is abstaining, okay. She's, does she prefer to see the letter? Okay. Well, well, the letter will be shared before it would go out. Um, okay, thank you. We need to move on. Thanks, everyone. I had a feeling that discussion was going to be a long one. And it's already 7.30, so I apologize for that. Uh, I'm going to move very quickly. Uh, I'm not even going to bring up the, which I sent out, was the communication to Commissioner Kafori about uh, alternative shelters. I have four other letters in my possession from different groups regarding uh, sanctions shelters. And I am gonna just send out more information to the rest of the board and, and it will be something that we can talk about more fully perhaps next month, even though it is kind of urgent but that would take us another half an hour to an hour to talk through that one. Um, I wanna report sadly that we have two board resignations coming up. Uh, Tom Lavoie will be uh, leaving us in July, right Tom? You're gonna to get one more month. And sadly, uh, Christian. Uh, Christian will be leaving us at some point. Uh, again, sad to lose any members, but. Christian, I don't think you're leaving us immediately. And um, Christian, as you know, has been our treasurer for several years and uh, uh, doing a stellar job for us. And uh, one thing we're gonna need is someone to take over the treasurer's position. And I know I think Christian has reached out to some people and so far uh, we don't have any takers, but uh, I'm gonna make a plea for someone out there who would be willing to take on that position. And I tell you, the way Christian has handled it these past years, can step right in, it's just, it's just a plug and play. I mean, it's, it's, it's really very well organized. And uh, so I hope someone just let me know or let Christian know if you have any interest in, in being my treasurer. If it makes it any easier for anyone who's thinking about it, you don't actually have to deal with checks and stuff that come in and all that kind of stuff. Um, you, you they're, they're, I get those, log them in and then send them to you all logged in. So you're not having to deal with a lot of that kind of stuff. Day -day. But you do have to prepare a monthly report again. And that's really, I think it's really straightforward the way Christian has set it up. And you do have to write some checks 
every once in a while, which 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 I sign. So Treasurer and I have have you know communications with each other. So please, please, someone uh, step up on that one. Uh, okay, with that, actually, I am going to jump uh, with that since we're talking with Christian. We do have to pass a budget tonight, and because we're going to run out of time, I want to make sure we get that done. So, Christian, could you take that over, please, at this point? Of course. Um, so, really quickly, yes, please. If you're interested at all in the treasure roll, reach out to me. I'll take you. I'll buy you coffee. We'll talk about the roll, <laughs> what it entails. You get to spend time with me. It'll be fun. Um, <laughs> but moving on to the budget. So, because I'm, I'm stepping down in the next few months, I did want to spend some time recapping quickly our previous budget really to set us up for success. Um, so this last fiscal year, or actually kind of our, our current fiscal year, we had a balanced budget that we voted on and it was about $14,000. We spent about $17,000. Um, our bank overview, uh, just looking at, you know, where we started and where, what our bank balance is at now. Um, beginning of this fiscal year, it was about $65,000 and now it's about $51,000. Um, we brought in about $7,200 in donations, um, which half of which is related to Judy's um, pet station program. Um, and honestly, we would have almost had a balanced budget. I think this is really the point I want to nail home, um, except that we love to support our community and we approved several expenditures over the last year that we didn't bring in fundraising dollars to fund. Um, so, you know, larger donations to, to other communities and also the small business COVID program, which really put us, um, you know, not in a net neutral position. So as we move forward, this will probably be, you know, another tight budget year. Sarah, I'm sure will do great work to, to get our coffers up and, and fundraise. Um, but just keep that in mind that when we're introducing these really great ideas and projects to support our community, we really need to think about, especially as our, our bank balance decreases, you know, how do we also raise funds to meet some of these programs? So with that, I will move to looking forward. Um, so still a pretty conservative budget. Uh, our budget is just slightly larger at $14,700. And Bill, I will send this to you, by the way, in, in an email so you have those these notes. Um, we anticipate holding some small sort of fundraiser um, and committee budget requests generally remained below each committee's typical budget request. So everybody sent me basically, you know, requests below what they would send me in a typical year. Um, so great summary on the third tab, if you all received the budget, which you should have, details on tab two, an overview of year to year on tab one. So with that, um, I will leave it at that. And if you have any questions, um, please fire away. And if there are no questions, if everybody's had a chance to study it, uh, we, we do need to approve it as this is the end of the fiscal year, uh, end of this month. So if there are no questions or concerns, I would like to uh, call for a motion to approve the budget as presented. I move that we approve the budget as presented. I second. Okay, we have a second. Uh, uh, opposed? Abstain. Okay, budget is passed unanimously. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. Great work. Um, thank you, committee chairs as well. Yeah. Thanks to everyone for, for cooperating with Christian and, and helping us figure it out. Okay, I am going to jump to livability, and I'm going to skip a whole bunch of things I wanted to report tonight, but nothing that's urgent. Urgent. So. Uh, I'm going to jump to livability. Uh, Judy, please. I'll be very brief. Um, just three items. The Art in the Pearl is on. I think that we had talked about that previously. It will be about 100 artists. It will be the weekend of Labor Day from the 4th through the 6th. We'll be uh, asking for volunteers. We're going to need at least 70 to 80 volunteers. And it will be a fenced event. Um, uh, exciting. I'm going to be a part of the volunteer committee with the Art in the Pearl board. And um, it'll be our opportunity to show that it's safe 
to come downtown. So we got to make this work. Um, May 28th, we had uh, Mayor Wheeler visit us in the Pearl District at Jameson Park. He joined our clean team. Uh, there were about 30 clean teamers. We got some good photographs of all of us in our vests and Bill did some nice photographs on our website. And uh, he did not walk about with us, but he did um, commend us on our work. And he told us that just that day that ODOT had agreed to clean up the um, entrances and exits along um, 405 and um, I-5. So we're, we're excited about that on an ongoing basis. O ODOT has committed to that. Lastly, we have a good neighbor that has come forward and, and uh, she has offered to do a fundraiser for the Pearl to raise money to replace the Fido stations. And her name is Gloria Feinstein and she's a photographer. So she's going to do an event called, this will be on June the 19th. It's going to be um, from four to eight in the Fields Park. Bill has done a nice workup on our website to broadcast it. The sittings for dogs will be $65 uh, per donation and $50 of each um, dog shot will be donated to the uh, PDNA FIDO um, project. So it'll be a fun thing. And it's we're going to make this the first of maybe several we may even move down the road and have one that has, you know, the best costume or something. So if you want to know more about that, just look online. Thanks so much. That's the end of my report. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Jay. And, and just quickly, we, we, after months of back and forth, we finally did, a, did get a permit from Parks and Rec for uh, additional uh, pet stations. So always takes time. Okay. Um, I know that Ad, uh, Ad Hoc Security Committee has a brief report. Uh, David Reza, planning, transportation, anything um, of note that you want to report? Uh, well, the bridge open, Flanders Crossing is finally open. We're so happy about that. And I just wanted to give a shout out to Reza. He delivered a speech uh, at the ribbons uh, cutting ceremony and uh, knocked it out of the park. It was a fantastic speech. Uh, and if you notice, he looks like Ned Flanders, which is why him <laughs> and his, his, his other bicycling friends all dressed up as Ned Flanders uh, as an anniversary. They did this several years ago to promote the bridge and they all dressed up again as Ned Flanders last night and went across the bridge. So I just want to shout out to all the hard work Rez has done, not only in the, the behind the scenes work but what a fantastic representation for us in front of the city and the press there. So thank you, Reza. Yeah, Thanks, Reza, Reza. I, I've, been getting, I've been getting some requests for you to be a guest speaker at various uh, places. So I'll pass them on to you. Wow, okay, sure. And Bill <laughs> captured his speech really well. I mean, yeah. thank you for doing that, Bill. It was, it was wonderful. Reza, you did a fabulous job. I loved all the background that you gave. Thanks, Thanks Reza. Yeah, I just wanted to, I think the story of this bridge hadn't been told um, until I was able to provide that background. So I'm really glad that the city gave me the opportunity to participate. It was a fabulous day for an opening. You couldn't ask for better, wet, better weather. And yeah. Um, yeah, thanks everyone. Great, thank, thank you. So we haven't been meeting much. Uh, there hasn't been a lot on the docket, but we've been our separate little uh, ad hoc committee of action group for 13th. So we're hoping John Hollister's been working, a lot of other folks, uh, Laura with PDBA, uh, working hard to activate 13th. We're hoping to do a big splash for 4th of July. So please come down and uh, just help activate 13th. We're working on it. Hopefully some good things come in. We're going to do some planters, get rid of some of those ugly barricades. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So please, if you want to help, reach out. It's all about rolling up the sleeves and, and getting it done. So that's what we're working on right now. Great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John. Anything on e prep? Oh. Stan, as the hour is long, I will be very brief. Um, uh, we're, we will be bringing our uh, disaster water. Um, 
group buy campaign to a close this month because we'll be taking delivery of the approximately 1500 aqua bricks um, in a couple of weeks. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks. Great, John. Great program. Really terrific. Um, okay. Uh, ad hoc security, uh, David or John Hollister, anything to report? Uh, just really quick, we, uh, John and I have been uh, busy meeting with uh, private security uh, officials, uh, sorry, firms, public safety officials, uh, uh, professionals, um, folks involved in public private partnerships. We sent out a big survey. Um, PDBA allowed us to use their survey monkey uh, infrastructure and we sent out a big survey. Hopefully a lot of you got that and we've uh, collected an amazing amount of data. So we're really just in that phase of really looking at, okay, what are, what are the options out there uh, in terms of the services available? What are the needs and what are creative approaches? So we're just in that data collection mode, uh, drilling down so that we really have a good picture of all the safety issues in terms of results or, or, or um, sorry, approaches. And then, you know, really identifying what the greatest needs are and then seeing, um, different approaches on how to handle that. So we're still very much in that data collection phase and hope to have something uh, more to report down the road. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, David and John, for your work on that. Um, Laura, do you have anything to report for PDBA? I know we're doing a lot of work together. That's really exciting, so thanks. Yeah, um, I have been working quite a bit on the 13th Street activation. Um, and uh, just recently on the 4th of July, um, hopefully we have a little bit of a bing bang fun thing on 4th of July. Um, I don't know how, how deep you want me to go into the report, but um, we do have some things cooking. It looks like instead of the 4th of July, it'd probably be the third since it's a Saturday, um, but we are looking into um, noise variants and permits and all that kind of stuff to have some maybe a couple live bands happening um, and a lot of the other bars and restaurants on the street are going to be um, applying for their OLCC licenses to hopefully make the whole um, 13th street be a um, kind of a fun activated place for that for that does anybody have any questions actually because I I do have more information I don't know how much you want me to Dig well, in. I think we can. I, I think if anybody wants to know more, they, they can reach out to you. And, Great. You know, yeah, please do. Out, please do. Running out of time tonight. So. Yeah, no, totally. And John knows too, John Hollister as well. So um, please feel free. I'll, I'll type in my email in case you guys don't have it right in the chat. Okay, great. Thank, thanks, Laura. Uh, quickly, coalition passed the, passed the budget last night. Uh, Coalition voted to accept the Southwest Hills Neighborhood Association into the coalition since there's no more uh, Southwest Neighborhood uh, Inc. Is, is, was not funded by the city, as I think we all know. So Southwest Hills uh, asked to join the Northwest Coalition. We accepted them last night. And we are in the midst of a, uh, just starting in a strategic planning process Executive Director Mark Sieber, who many of you know, uh, will be retiring at the end of the year. So part of the strategic planning is to figure out a, a succession plan. So there, there's a lot going on there as well. Uh, lastly, John Hollister, you want to announce the six gift card winners real quickly? Yes, sir. We have... Um... Uh, so going through, as we all know, we have the uh, Bring Back Business Program, and it will be this month and next month that we will be able to announce winners, and then that will will take care of the uh, uh, the funds that we uh, um, that we donated this program. So right now there are three 100 winners for June, and it is Justin Thompson, Andrea LeBaron. And Eugene Newell. Those are our three $100 winners. Our two $250 winners are Anne Marie Arada and Rick uh, Amadio. 
And our $500 winner is Scott Sunday. So I will be reaching out to them and making sure that they, uh, they get those. And like everyone else, they're pretty excited and, um, and they go out and, and spread the, uh, um, their wealth into the community. So there you go. Great. Thank you, John. One more month to go on that. So with that, uh, any last thoughts, comments, Judy? Just to end, <clears throat> end on a couple of really feel good notes. Um, forgot to mention one of the important things about the May 28th event with the clean team. Afterwards, we went to Via Delizia and um, kind of gave our backstories. There were about, you know, 10 or 15 of us that met there. And this has built, the clean team has built an amazing, amazingly tight community for us and the support that we're able to lend to others. It's, it's really, it just keeps growing and growing and getting better and better. And another thing, another item is that a new perspective on where we were when we were having the direct action marches. Remember earlier in the year, how tense we all were and how concerned we were about the fields and Jim Rice. And I was in there the other night uh, doing my PDBA work by reaching out for memberships and he is doing so well. And um, the place was full. So things are looking up and um, we're, it, it gave me a new perspective on how we're doing right now, kind of the pulse on the pearl. That's all I have. Thank you. And I think that's a great note with which to end the meeting unless anybody else has anything pressing. My apologies for running over, but I think we had some really important conversation tonight. So uh, with that- Patricia let's... had something? Patricia. Yeah, I, I just wanted to suggest that that adorable creature that is sitting on Bill's lap become the official mascot <laughs> of our organization. <laughs> Sorry, he, he has night, been Sparky. he has been pouncing me all night this whole meeting and he just had it. So he was like jumped up onto my lap. So I'm like, okay, I'll hold as you. as he should, as he should. He's part of the meeting, part of our group. Thank you. Good, that's <laughs> I just want to quickly say something quickly. Um, Bill, I was going to talk about your dog. It's already been talked about now. Um, but I do want to say Judy is the best PDBA board member I've seen. She is slinging memberships like no other. Judy is That's, that's a no star. surprise. No She's surprise. a star. She's amazing. That's all I've she seen. has me opening up a business so that I can then join. So. <laughs> hey, I'm joining. I'm not even opening a business. I'm going right. To Anyway. Yeah, just bring okay, it everyone. Well, thanks. Thanks for great conversation. Again, sorry it ran so late, but lots to cover. So, see you next time. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone.